Welcome to Clay to Z. I'm Kara, and I am working in the Amico Marketing Studio this morning. So those of you who have joined me before, you know that what I'm doing here is just a casual video live stream where I'm making things. People may show up from time to time in our studio and I uh, have several people here today, but at the moment they're, they're uh, not on screen. They've got other things happening. So I am still working on the bust that I've been uh, building for the past several weeks. I just have the top of the head and any details. I think I'm going to leave it relatively rough. And then what I want to do is uh, use the satin mat technique, and I'll show you an example of that. Hi, Camille. Good morning. You must be up early to, to see this. Uh, so I'm also, while I'm doing this, I'm also making little ghosts uh, for some future glaze uh, projects. Hang on a moment. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Thank you. Pardon me. <gasps> nope. <coughs> We're not done. David, your timer is going off. So to make little ghosts, I'm going to start with a ball of clay. And I'm just going to do them with a pinch method. So I start with a ball of clay and pinch, pinch, pinch starting at the very, very bottom and working my way down. And I want these to be really narrow kind of pinch forms. So Camille says it's 7.30, having coffee. That's not too early. Hi, Janet. Good morning. And hi, Christina. <laughs> Christina says, I'm here. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> I, I didn't know we were trying to get rid of you, Christina, but I'm glad you're here. And uh, so I'm just pinching a ghost. Pinch, pinch. So you see it's really, really hollow on the inside. I, I make my pinch pots as thin as I can right from the get-go. It makes it easier in the long run instead of having to kind of fold them as you get it, when you try to make them narrower. So I kind of shape as I go. Now, this is also on Monday, not Monday, Tuesday, I was uh, doing the live stream uh showing the new satin matte glazes and uh, I had a comment asking uh, for a demo on how I build some of those forms and most of the forms that you see in our new satin matte ads um, I made I made all of them and they are all hand built and they are almost all pinch forms so uh, they, they all get started pretty much just like this and I'm going to demonstrate one later on today so they're just they're just pinch pots um, in a way so there's there's my basic ghost shape I'll thin it out a little more so what is everybody working on this week? You have throwing projects or hand building projects going on. I'm emptying molds. Yes, David is emptying molds. He is casting our half cups. You probably see him doing this quite a bit. And the half cups are for the uh, Potter's Choice layering. So that is what we use is actually ha half cups can hear him pouring the slip out. Camille's making moon jars. Here, let's look. You can see he's already cast them. There he goes. Pours them into the pouring table. Pour out the excess slip. That slip will get reclaimed and used. So 
not going to waste. So there's one little ghosty. I have another one here, much bigger. So I'll make them in different sizes. And we'll see how that goes. Now, before I get too far along, this is not leather hard, but it's getting pretty firm, which is great because it means that I can do a lot more with it. I have my paddle out, my throwing. Uh, Janet making more of the very popular Thirsty Coasters. I love that. So I'm going to paddle this jaw in a little bit. When I looked at it from the front, I thought it looked a little too big over there. So I'm going to paddle, 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 paddle. actually going to be kind of a test piece. I wanted to try out some different things. It's kind of a big test piece. Uh, Marie says, good morning. Good morning, Marie. And Lauren says, I'm about to start an exhibition piece on the wheel. Nice. So we have lots to do this weekend. So you see how I've been coil building this and let me Prop that up just a little bit, and you can see Marie is making platters with underglaze transfers, and then after the bisque, I'll coat with Sky Celadon. I love using the Celadons with underglaze transfers. It They work so well, so pretty. So this is, it, you, you guys have seen me coil building this, and you see how I'm coming up from the front. It's even more obvious that it's coming up like a point. Der Girl says, I've been underglaze washing some bisque pieces. I love that too. Great way to get texture on things. So let me move this a little bit more. You can see what I'm doing. I want to make sure these, this is the right thinness. And then I'm going to use my toothy rib toothy scraper and score that surface. Make sure it's nice and rough. Scoring, very, very important. It helps to meld those pieces of clay together, almost like Velcro. As a teacher, when I saw a lot of pieces come apart in bisque firing, look to look at the seams and oftentimes things would come apart on a seam and it would be where there was no scoring. It would just be two flat pieces of clay put together and they would not hold up. So I am making this kind of like a little cone head and there's a reason behind this. And this is something that uh, I use for all forms, not just figurative forms, but any time that you're making something that you want to have a rounded top and you don't want that, and it's gonna be closed, and you don't want that top to collapse and get lower. So I kind of squish that closed, make it like a little cone head. And then I'm gonna paddle it take some more of that off. It's pretty thick. There we go. So what I'm doing is I'm making it like a cone. Uh, Gwen, uh, uh, Janet was explaining the Thirsty Coasters last week because I had never heard of such a thing. So Janet, if you will, will, uh, Explain that for Gwen, because I don't think that I can adequately explain. So I'm going to paddle this. It's still kind of sticky. I'm going to let it set up just a little bit more, because that clay is kind of on the sticky side, and it's sticking to my paddle. But what I'm going to do is paddle it into the right shape. <laughs> Christina says, the bust looks like my ex. It has a blank stare. 
Mm, good thing they're the X. So uh, I'm going to paddle it until it reaches the shape I want. And what that does is the clay has already been in that, that shape. And as it compresses down, it's not going to collapse because it's, it's still kind of in that formation. Uh, it's almost like building an arch out of the head. So it, the compression uh, helps to keep the head in, in shape. And so it won't crack or uh, collapse. So that's one of my, my tricks for making figurative pieces or any kind of sculpture that needs to uh, hold its shape at the top and be closed up. Until I said I'm going to wait on paddling this and then I'm still paddling. Lack of patience. I'm going to set that aside and go back to ghosts. So, oh, I'll show you what I have in mind for those of you who've been tuning in. Uh, as also, also on the uh, Q and Amico on Tuesdays, alternating Tuesdays, this is what I have in mind, not necessarily octopi, but this is my finished cake dish with my painted octopi. And I really liked how it came out. So this is two coats of satin matte white on the 11M clay, which is what I'm using here. And then I directly on the raw glaze, I painted with smugs. And so I get this really satiny smooth finish, but very, very painterly effect. So I really liked how that came out. I'm gonna do something like that on here and see how that goes. Oh, don't want to put my water bottle right in front. So I'm going to make a couple more ghosts. And I'd love to hear if you guys have other things going on. You're welcome to ask me any questions you may have. Uh, about Amico glazes or... Uh, clay or uh, other products. I just recently saw a fantastic uh, TikTok using uh, Rub and Buff. Uh, Christina asks, do you spray the entire bust before wrapping in plastic when done for the day? Uh, I really don't. I only spray the part that I'm going to work on next. So I might spray the very top. I might spray a little bit of the face if I'm going to do some more detailing on the face. So uh, it just depends on what I'm going to do next. But I always spray the top where I'm going to add more clay. Always. So another ghost, another pinch pot. I'm looking to see if I might be missing any comments. Oops. I'll close that because I thought my volume was off. Okay, now my volume is off. There we go. Can you hold up, your girl says, can you hold up the cake plate again so we can see the satin sheen? Yeah, can you see that? So it is satiny. It's not glossy, but it's not really like a true matte. It's really just a, a silky satin glaze. And then you can see even where the underglazes were painted over it, you can still see the sheen of the satin. Oops. Sorry, I've got limited space here. So 
Uh, so we have new satin matte colors coming out. That's been very exciting. New Celadon colors coming out. Also very exciting. Thank you. Uh, Dear Girl says gorgeous. Thank you. And you're very, very welcome. Uh, I love sharing my love for the smugs and satin matte. So fun. Uh, so new Celadon's coming out. We also have new velvets coming out. So four new colors of velvets, five new colors of Celadon, and six new colors of satin mats. Those should all be available at distributors by the end of the month. So keep your eyes open. And I'll be talking more about all of them on the Tuesday streams. Um, I've done the new Celadons and the new Satin Mats, and I'll be discussing the new Velvets in uh, two more weeks. So while I'm <laughs> let you see what I'm doing, I'm just holding it in my lap. And uh, Kathleen asks if I would hold the cake stand up again. So yeah, this is thrown and then assembled, and then two coats, three coats, two or three, of the satin matte white, cone five, and then the smugs painted uh, over the raw unfired glaze, and then fired to cone five. Uh, Lauren asks, can the satins be layered with other Amico colors? And yes, they can. Uh, they are, because the satin mats are very, very, very stiff, uh, most of the layering doesn't move much. So you'll see the color of the satin mat, but it's not going to interact like you would have if you layered PCs over PCs, for example, and uh, uh, so we've done it, and I don't usually show a lot of it because it's generally kind of like, yep, that's a glaze over another glaze. It doesn't really do anything, uh, but you can use them as a base if you want to have just a really nice satiny color with uh, with more uh, fluid glazes over it. You're welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Uh, so I have used um, the new Flux glazes with the satin mats, and they look nice. They do look nice. You're not going to have crazy interactions like layering PCs, but they look really pretty. And yes, you can. Now keep in mind, always with layering, uh, Lauren, we do not test layered combinations for food safety just because there's just too many variables. Uh, the satin mats are completely mixable, so you can layer satin mats with other satin mats and mix satin mats with other satin mats and know that they uh, uh, will be food safe but we do not test layered combinations, so we would recommend that you do that. Uh, Christina says, when adding clear to my celadons, they sometimes streak once glaze fired. Should there be a rest period before applying? Uh, it can be difficult to make sure that they're really uh, mixed thoroughly, but I feel like streaking would be either a mixing issue or an application issue. So either make sure that you have mixed it thoroughly and then use a fresh brush to apply because the brush can of course hold glaze. Uh, so it may have like little reservoirs of, of uh, clear or colored glaze that are not really thoroughly mixed make this so you can see me working on ghosties. Um, the other is to make sure that you're applying enough coats. So uh, 
Uh, and and uh, I find that applying the celadons, I work relatively fast, but um, I also go back over my coats to make sure that they're they're uh, even. And so I'll overlap a little bit as which with each brush stroke, not on each coat, but like each brush stroke, I overlap each brush stroke so that there's uh, not thick and thin areas. Mostly it takes practice. So another ghosty. I'm also going to put little arms on them. Maybe not on all of them. Some of them. Oh, and Janet is talking about the thirsty, uh, uh, thirsty coasters. So uh, she says, I'm using EM-104 earthenware, roll a texture onto it and bisque to 04. Uh, she's using five inch cookie cutters, or you can use whatever size works for you. Uh, wait until they're past leather hard to clean the bottom edge. Use Amico underglaze on the top and wipe back to show the texture. On the bottom, I use Amico Low Fire Clear and Fire to 05. I assume that you uh, fire them face down and put a four inch cork round on the bottom. They're great for cold drips where condensation is an issue, uh, but they will stain if coffee or other things like that are spilled on it. Oh, Christina says, Oh my goodness, I think you nailed it. I think it's the brush uh, with the streaky mixed clears, uh, mixing clear plus other celadons. Janet says, I love the satin finish, but as I work with 378 speckled clay for sculptural pieces, I am struggling with the results, even with adding a light colored slip or velvet layer on the clay. Any other tips on how I can get the satins to work better for me on a dark clay base? Um, we've actually had really good luck with using uh, the ultra white underglaze. Uh, two coats of ultra white underglaze and then the satin matte white over it. So uh, I'm not sure, but uh, you could try using... Um, a porcelain slip if you mix up a porcelain slip. Janet says, yes, I was correct. Fired top down. Uh, I figured that was easy, the, easier than stilting. Uh, so going back to Janet with the satin on a dark clay, I have used the satin mats on a dark red terracotta body that uh, I like to use for sculptural forms. And uh, as I said, we've done some testing using the ultra white velvet underglaze and it worked pretty well. I, I would say it wasn't like a true, true white, but it was certainly white enough to use as a, uh, uh, like a canvas for the uh, underglaze work. And the other option would just be to, to use a lighter colored sculpture clay. So. I'm sculpting this with a white stoneware. This is the 11M Amex. And I, I like using it for sculptural work. I do have to be a little more patient uh, and let it dry a little bit longer than if I was using uh, a very groggy sculpture body. But it works pretty well. And I can always do mixed media, well, not mixed media. I can do mixed uh, techniques so I can throw this as well as sculpt it. Some sculpture clays are really, really coarse and I wouldn't want to throw them on a wheel. So I think that my first ghosty might be ready for arms. So I'm gonna finish up this one. I need to make at least six or seven today.
And the other thing that I do before I put the arms on is I smooth them out. So, you know, the, right now as a pinch pot, it still has a lot of texture from my fingers and some cracks from where I'm pushing it out to make it the shape that I want. So my figure, I'm leaving it relatively uh, uh, textured from my hands because I, I kind of want to leave that in there. Is this firm enough? Not yet. But with my ghosts, I want them to be smooth. So, and some of you probably seen me do this before, my technique for making things smooth is, again, my toothy rib. I use my toothy rib so much for so many things. I use it to score to join and I use it to smooth. So you see how it's scuffed up that surface completely. Janet, yeah, try a porcelain slip. That might help. Uh, Test it with your clay body so that you know it doesn't come off. See if that helps. So I just go over all the surfaces. And... And then I turn it around to the smooth edge and use my smooth edge. To smooth out the clay and you can see that it takes out most of those finger textures. And by working this way and then doing it again when it's leather hard, I can really smooth out that surface if that's what I'm going for. Janet says, ah, I was also using the white velvet, not the ultra white. So I'm encouraged I can get this resolved. The ultra white is a little bit more opaque. The white, it's difficult to make a white underglaze that's really, really opaque without it, uh, it but still can go on greenware or, or go on bisqueware without coming off. Uh, so I think you'll have better luck with the ultra white. So it's still kind of on the wet side, but it's soft enough, it's firm enough where I could add some little arms. I'm just going to put little, little arms on it. So I'm going to take two little pieces of clay, make them into little cones. I'm not going to cut the eyes out until it's a little firmer. Tip this down so you can see what I'm doing. Spray my water and vinegar on there. Well, of course, it's not going to stick on. I can't push it hard enough. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. 
There it is. It's my little wood tool. Kind of mash it from the inside. And I'm going to leave it a little bit rough for now. When it's firmer, I'll come back and smooth it out. So there's one little ghosty arm. So there's one little ghost. When it's a little firmer, I'll cut open its eyes and smooth it out a little bit more. And I will also trim up the bottom. I was thinking I might make it a little bit jagged. I don't know. We'll see. So I have lots of fun making stuff like this and trying out different things and I'm always open to changing it up a little bit from what I originally had planned because sometimes I come up with better ideas. So I think of it as clay. I take my play very seriously. Ah, uh, you like the arms? Thank you. I like those arms. I think they're really cute little arms. I'm not making scary ghosts. I'm trying to make sweet, funny, friendly ghosts. Next week, the, uh, the witch hat trinket dish ring holders will be out of the kiln and ready to glaze. So I'll be glazing those. So the piece that I was asked about, how I made it, was this one. Let's show it a little better. So um, while I'm working on yet another pinch pot, I'll talk about this. So this one is, is just sculptural. It has a hole in the bottom, so it's not a vessel. But I plan on making another one that will be a vessel. So it'll have an opening here. And I might even make several and have them like tulipiers where it has multiple holes um, or just a single hole uh, for a few flowers but uh, uh, this was built just the way that you see me making the ghosts so it was 
a pinch pot at the bottom. This part was made as a pinch pot with a narrow opening, and then I flattened the bottom. And uh, then I used a slab to make the upright piece here. And then these are just pinch pots added on. Uh, but I will show how I make that. I'll start one of those this week and I'll work on it next week as well. And I'm going to, let me see if I can beat on the head of my sculpture a little bit before I let you all go. Get this head. Eh, it's still a little sticky, but it's getting better. You have to be careful doing this. You don't want to knock everything over. Now, I will say something about doing pieces like this. If you find that it's not big enough, like you want the back of the head to be larger, build hair on it, something like that, do not just take clay and lay it over there. Even if you score it and slip it, you're adding too much clay and the moisture in the inner layers cannot escape. This is really sticky. So if you find that you need to make something larger, like I said, like the back of the head, because the back of the head on this looks a little, a little bit flat. The thing to do is to cut it open like so. It's like doing surgery. So cut it open. and add clay like that. So you always need to think of this, even though I know you're making a figure and you're thinking about it uh, in the sense of the outside, when you're making stuff that is going to be fired, you need to remember that it is still going to have to get fired like a pot. And Marie says, that looked kind of scary, stabbing the back of the head. Yeah, doing a little, doing a little surgery on this. Look at that. Kind of scary. It's okay. It's just clay. So to make that back of the head a little fuller, I could have worked this from the inside when it was still open, but I didn't. So add my vinegar and water. I want this coil to kind of be on the outside more than the inside so that it doesn't sink in. But then I'm, all, I'm still going to do this a little bit bigger than I want it so that I can paddle it right down into shape. Works best that way. I want to make sure I don't get too thin. There we go. cable. Uh, I think we're back. Okay, sorry about that. Had a little interruption. I hope we're back. Um, yeah, we're back. 
So, so I'm still going to make this a little bit bigger so I can paddle it into shape. That kind of helps it hold its form and not collapse. Also helps to seal those seams that I created since I can only really close them from one side. And it doesn't look scary anymore. A little surgery and it's all done. So Pat is asking about the ghosts. Could I push the arms out from the inside, maybe add a little clay on the outside where you want the little arms? I could, but it would get uh, very, very thin. And I like these little arms to be really pointy because these are already pretty thin walls. Now, if I want to make sure that I don't have, if, if I make them a little thicker and I don't want to worry about uh, the thickness, I can actually take a tool and poke from the inside just to create a hole. But I, I, just, uh, I just add them on. Um, easier than trying to poke them out and having thick and thin areas. Because thick and thin areas in clay is really asking for cracking to happen. You want... You want things to be as even as you can. Here we go. So the head is more or less complete. Now I'll let that dry and then I'll be glazing it. And I'm gonna go back to finishing this. And then when I get this ghosty made, I'm gonna call it a day and let you all go. Uh, Christina says, um, hairstylist here for years. Plenty of people have odd shaped heads. Yes, they do. Uh, definitely. I've seen lots of people who have odd shaped heads, but I try to make the heads look um, as ideal as possible. I like a round head. So, uh, and Janet says that worked great. Uh, the, the, I, I assume you mean the, the cutting, cutting open the head. So I am almost done with this ghosty yes janet with <laughs> brain surgery <laughs> It was kind of like brain surgery. Um, so it it does reach a point when you're working on figurative pieces where you kind of forget that it's it's really not, it doesn't have feelings. And you start to kind of give it human attributes. And you have to keep reminding yourself that it is still more or less just a pot. And... Uh, you can approach it just the same way that you would any pot. And just like if I was adding a spout to a teapot, I'm just gonna cut it open and put, put things in where they need to go. So there's my final ghosty for the day. Thank you all for joining me 
my Clay to Z adventures. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will see you all next week for a little bit more. This might be ready to go in the kiln by then, but I will have some other things to be glazing. And I'm going to start working on one of these and maybe a couple other uh, replicas of things that I made for the satin mats. So I hope that I will see you again. Thank you all. Have a great weekend.